Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for February 2019. Thank you for joining our presentation this month. Our presenter today is Dr. Julian Hawker. Dr. Hawker is the Sir John and Lady Eaton Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a Senior Scientist at the Women's College Research Institute. She is a health services researcher who has published over 250 peer-reviewed articles. Her main research focus is on disparities in access to care for people living with osteoarthritis. In her role as department chair, she has been implementing strategies to enhance equity, diversity, and professionalism, with a particular focus on advancing women in academic medicine. We're especially excited for today's presentation, the first in a two-part series on the burden of osteoarthritis. Welcome, Dr. Hawker. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Um, so this is actually the first part, as you said, of a presentation um, that was developed by ORSI, ORSI being the International Osteoarthritis Research uh, Society, to um, lay out a white paper that was developed. And I'm going to start with uh, section number one, which will be on the burden of osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis epidemiology, morbidity, and comorbidity. Um, this is a work that I'm presenting that came from a, a individuals around the world. I won't go through all of the names, but suffice it to say that this has really been a group effort and I'm very grateful and only the person presenting here, not the person that did all the work. So I'm gonna talk about the rationale for de demonstrating that osteoarthritis is a serious disease. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the global prevalence of osteoarthritis and the impact of this disease in terms of disability on our, on our population, economic costs and impact on ability to work. Nigel Artem will be presenting in a second session and uh, you will hear from him later. So this uh, white paper was developed as a result of uh, the problem we're having in the world of osteoarthritis with getting new drugs developed that will adequately treat um, patient symptoms and ultimately prevent all the progression of the disease and get rid of the need for surgery. So currently in the US, it is required that drugs demonstrate an effect on what we call structural osteoarthritis. In other words, to be improved as a disease-modifying drug, they must show a change in the joint space uh, on plain x-ray. Well, we know that that is a very, very insensitive marker of disease progression. It's kind of like using a stroke to diagnose high blood pressure. So it's waiting until the horse is so far out of the barn to know that we've got worsening of disease and that's clearly inadequate in this day and age. So the rationale for the white paper that I will be presenting is that the guidelines uh, developed by the Food and Drug Administration in 2014 introduced four new programs to facilitate and expedite drug development in the US and indirectly, obviously, elsewhere in the world. And the point of these four new programs was to address unmet need in the treatment of what they defined as serious or life-threatening conditions. They said that to qualify for accelerated approval of a new drug, it needed to treat a serious condition, it needed to provide a meaningful advantage over available treatments, and it needed to have a demonstrated effect on an intermediate clinical endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And just to put that in the context of perhaps lay language, for instance, we know that if we reduce blood sugar in patients with diabetes, we will reduce the risk of diabetes complications. If we reduce the level of uh, blood lipids or cholesterol, we will reduce the risk of stroke. So in other words, if we could have an intermediate outcome for osteoarthritis, which showed that we could prevent progression of disease and need for drug replacement, we would be in good, good position. Currently, when we do trials in osteoarthritis uh, of new drugs, we might have a young person that's had an ACL, anterior cruciate ligament tear, where we know their likelihood of going on to develop end-stage osteoarthritis is very high, but it's gonna take a long time. As I've already said, currently in trials, we have to prove that the drug has reduced the progression to or worsening of x-ray change. And that's just not feasible, which is why we're not getting drugs developed. What we're saying is that 
what we might use as our intermediate marker in the future would be MRI, the picture shown in the middle, where we know that bone marrow lesions, so changes in the um, fluid structure of the bone, might actually beautifully predict that end stage, but be available for study in a much, much shorter period of time. So that's our goal, to be able to develop these intermediate markers so that we can start developing new drugs. They defined a serious condition as one that is associated with morbidity that has substantial impact on day-to-day -day functioning. And it doesn't have to be irreversible, but it must be persistent or recurrent. So we developed this white paper under the auspices of ORSI to provide an in-depth literature review and to uh, undertake cohort analyses to make the case to the FDA that OA is a serious disease. This white paper was submitted in December of 16, and we are still waiting for, uh, they, they have acknowledged that OA is a serious disease, but where we take that and what biomarkers we can use as intermediate markers is still under review. So I'm gonna talk to you about the first part of the white paper, which is how have we established that osteoarthritis is a serious disease? So first off, the Global Burden of Disease, which is an international project and has been published in many, uh, many times in The Lancet, uh, has shown that the population burden of osteoarthritis is enormous, with over 240 million people living with symptomatic, so painful, stiff hips or knees in particular, about 3.8% of the population worldwide, and that is obviously an underestimate of all the people that are affected. Women are about twice as likely to have symptomatic disease than men, and the prevalence of uh, this condition is more common in higher income countries, as you can see here, and uh, increases with increasing age. This is just showing you the same data. The two pictures on the left are 1990, where the, the slides on the right are 2010. Men in the top, women in the bottom, across many, many countries just showing again that women are more likely and are still more likely to have disease than men, but in both populations of men and women, the disease uh, prevalence increases dramatically after middle age and is much higher in 2010 relative to 2000 and, uh, 1990. So why? Why is the prevalence of osteoarthritis going up? The reason is that the prevalence of risk factors for osteoarthritis are increasing, and that's what I'm gonna quickly go through. So we have a much, much better understanding of what causes osteoarthritis now than we did a decade ago. We know that there are two major factors that lead to the development of joint damage, and that includes local factors at the level of the joint, which change the way the joint is loaded, which includes injury, um, uh, loss of a ligament, obesity, uh, malalignment or abnormal bone shape, and muscle weakness. The second major pathway are systemic factors or whole body factors, which include aging, uh, gender, uh, genetics, prior inflammatory arthritis, and obesity as well. What people don't always understand is while we don't walk on our hands, uh, obesity is associated with a much higher risk of overall uh, inflammation in the body, and that inflammation is a clear risk factor for osteoarthritis, such that people with uh, obesity are about twice as likely to develop hand OA than people without obesity. If we think about the risk factors that have clearly increased over the past uh, few decades, the, many of these have um, become much more prevalent, and I'm just gonna quickly review this. So obesity, I think everybody knows that this is a huge problem. From the Global Burden of Disease publication in 2013, the overall um, all age prevalence of obesity was over a quarter of the population and has increased, sorry, over uh, uh, more than that in the population, but has increased by 26% between 2000 and 2013. In 2014, close to 40% of adults were overweight and about 13% of adults obese, which is well over a billion people worldwide. With respect to physical inactivity, physical acti inactivity is really important because it affects our muscle weakness, and I've said that that helps support the joints. 
Globally, we know that insufficient physical activity or physical inactivity is about 23% in adults in 2010. That means one in four adults get, were getting insufficient physical activity in 2010, higher in women than men, higher in high income than low income countries. You're gonna see that theme of higher in women and higher in low in high income countries across everything. But concerningly, while I've showed you obesity has increased by 26%, physical inactivity has increased 20% as well between 2000 and 2013. Finally, joint injury. Over the past few decades, there's been an increase in participation in youth sports and recreational activities in all ages. At the same time, we're less fit, we're more overweight or obese, and we have a much higher likelihood of joint injury, in particular meniscal and ligament tears. So we've got a rising uh, burden of risk factors, more people getting the disease, and uh, a lot greater uh, presence of people living with symptomatic disabling disease. We know that osteoarthritis is characterized by structural changes at the level of the joint and changes in, in the way people experience their, um, their joint health. In particular, symptoms are pain, aching, or stiffness. It can affect mood and sleep, and obviously impact ability to do daily activities, to work, and to enjoy the things that people like to do. Unlike inflammatory arthritis, in osteoarthritis, structural changes don't always mean you have symptoms, and symptoms don't always mean you have structural changes. And so getting at that sweet spot where people have structural change and symptoms has been a bit of a conundrum. The most distressing symptoms for people living with osteoarthritis have been well studied internationally. We know that the severity or intensity of the pain is a problem, but so is the quality. What kind of symptoms? Is it burning? Is it aching? Is it shooting? Is it numbness and tingling? The effect on sleep, the effect on mood, the unpredictability, particularly when knees start to give way and people can't rely on them and then obviously the impact on their ability to, to do the activities that they want. We've studied um, internationally the downstream effects of pain. Pain interrupts sleep causing and contributing to fatigue. Pain limits people's ability to do uh, activities and the combination of, combination of disability and fatigue contributes to depressed mood. About 25% of people living with uh, chronic painful OA are uh, living with depression. Disability and depression contribute to the inability to do the things that people want to do, which we call participation restrictions. They augment or worsen the pain cycle. And we know that when chronic pain is not treated, people can have changes in the pain pathways, resulting in what we call pain sensitization, which can be difficult to treat. All of this means that we've got a growing burden of disease in terms of people that are having mobility restrictions. Because we don't do a good job of diagnosing and treating osteoarthritis and don't have a lot of very effective treatments, uh, patients have told us, or people with OA have told us that their best way of managing their disease is to stop moving. So they do this partly because nobody's telling them or giving them other options. They're afraid of risky painkillers or other conditions are prioritized as more important. If they're obese, they often have hypertension or diabetes or heart disease as well as their osteoarthritis and so they just ignore their OA. This is really a problem though because we know that exercise is by far the most effective non-surgical treatment that we have for osteoarthritis, both in terms of pain in blue and in function in green, more so than for anti-inflammatory drugs seen on the right here. So our most effective treatment is to get people moving, and yet people are stopping moving in order to manage their pain. Um, physical activity, I think everybody knows, is critically important to the management, not only of osteoarthritis, but of, of other comorbid conditions like obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. We know that physical activity is important for weight control, for physical fitness. It improves joint stiffness, it strengthens the muscles and reduces the risk for falling. But it also helps to deal with those systemic inflammatory effects that happen uh, in combination with obesity. 
So it improves blood lipid or fat levels, it reduces blood sugar, and overall reduces inflammation. So there are many, many reasons we want people to be more active. And so the increasing levels of physical inactivity are a huge problem for our populations globally. We've been particularly interested in how untreated with the NEOA uh, contributes to mobility. And we know that mobility is really important to people living with everything really because they wanna remain independent. And as we get older and older and live longer and longer, we don't wanna end up in, in long-term care. So using data from a population cohort that we have here in Ontario, Canada, um, who were recruited from 100% of the population, 55 and over, we looked at um, uh, the people that responded that they had uh, hip and knee osteoarthritis based on criteria I'll show you. Almost 20,000 people were studied. We defined uh, symptomatic hip and knee OA based on self-reported pain, aching, or stiffness in a hip or a knee lasting at least six weeks in the past three months and no diagnosis of self-reported inflammatory arthritis. And that was a validated diagnosis. Um, we asked these people a whole bunch of questions, including whether or not they had difficulty walking, and it was simply dichotomized as yes or no and we asked a lot of questions about their other health problems. Summary, uh, what we found is that 10% had hip OA and 15% had knee OA based on this definition, which is about right based on our population epidemiology. And one quarter of the population of people uh, 55 and over reported that they had difficulty walking. When we looked at the relationship between having hip the knees affected by OA and likelihood of difficulty walking, compared to people that had no hips or knees uh, that were problematic. As the numbers of hips and knees affected increased, the overall likelihood of having uh, difficulty walking substantially increased in a dose-related mechanism after controlling for all sorts of other health problems. Put in a different way, we cre created what's called a clinical nom nomogram. And this is really the take home message. For a typical 60 year old middle income, normal weight woman who has health, no health problems, her likelihood of having difficulty walking is about 10%. If she has diabetes and heart disease, it increases to 20%. If she has two hips and knees with OA, but no diabetes or heart disease, it is 40%. And if she has a combination of osteoarthritis, diabetes, and heart disease, it's now 70%. So these uh, data were important in showing us the, the role of comorbid osteoarthritis in people with these other common conditions that we think are terribly important on mobility. And if we're not taking care of these people, osteoarthritis, we probably are having a negative impact on their heart disease and their diabetes outcomes as well. And so we have looked at that. We've looked at the relationship between OA-related difficulty walking and shown that it can increase the risk of diabetes and worsens the risk uh, for diabetes complications in people living with diabetes. We've shown a relationship, as have many, and you'll see this in the next presentation, uh, with cardiovascular disease and death, with high blood pressure, with obesity, with stroke, and with depression. So OA accounts for a huge amount of disability, not just due to the osteoarthritis, but due to all the downstream effects of living with osteoarthritis. The, this is defined by the global burden of disease using a term called years lived with disability. And it's been de defined or estimated that osteoarthritis accounts for two and a half percent of all years lived with disability globally and that that has increased 75% between 1990 and 2013. So I'll try to translate that. That means that over the, that period of time, there has been a 75% increase in the contribution of osteoarthritis to disability in the global population. And in fact, Osteoarthritis is now the third most rapidly rising condition associated with disability after diabetes and dementia. 
and I think that's really under-recognized by healthcare providers and policymakers internationally. This is just showing you the same data. This is uh, disease activity uh, limited, uh, limited years. Uh, for a number of conditions, you can see that the overall DALIs or ranking puts cardiovascular disease, this is ischemic heart disease, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, backs and necks, depression, diabetes, and MSK. If you consider backs and necks part of osteoarthritis, and I am a lumper, not a splitter, we are way up there. But the point is that you can see that the increase from 1990 to 2005, 2015, for both uh, MSK and backs and necks is a huge increase, relatively higher than that for heart disease, depression, but outranked by diabetes. The economic burden as a result of osteoarthritis is huge. In 2003 in the US, the total costs attributable to arthritis or other rheumatic diseases was estimated at 1.2% of the gross domestic product. Um, and almost half of the costs or a third of the costs have been attributed to indirect costs. That means lost earnings. That means out of, out of pocket costs to uh, people living with this disease. Direct costs are medical expenditures, indirect costs are costs to individuals, and osteoarthritis and other rheumatic diseases are particularly alarming because of the impact on costs to individuals. Arthritis, um, and most of this is osteoarthritis, accounts for one in 10 primary care visits, so visits to a primary doc care physician, and compared to age and sex matched peers, osteoarthritis pa patients have significantly higher out-of-pocket health-related expenditures. If we think about the costs to our population, to our society, and to people with OA, they can be looked at in terms of direct costs listed here, where caregivers might be provided by government societal costs, and that obviously varies tremendously in the US. Uh, from state to state as well as within states. The indirect costs in terms of ability to work, um, long-term life, and uh, the costs to society in terms of disability payments and benefits, and then obviously those huge intangible costs in terms of pain and suffering, quality of life, reduced quality of life, and uh, depression and anxiety. So the costs due to lost productivity are a huge issue for our governments especially since osteoarthritis is being seen at younger and younger ages because of obesity and injury. And it can be looked at two ways. Absenteeism is days off work due to an illness or due to a problem, whereas presenteeism is reduced self-reported productivity while at work. You can imagine that somebody who's very stiff or somebody who's having a lot of pain and associated depression might be less able to focus at work might have difficulty if they have a very significant functional requirement for their work in performing their work, not just um, being away from work. In the US between 2010 and 2012, of uh, 3.8 million adults with uh, a physician diagnosis of arthritis, most of which is osteoarthritis, 3.8 million reported that they were unable to work due to a health condition and 2.1 million reported that they were limited in the kind or amount of work they could do due to that health condition. Um, the indirect cost due to lost productivity has been estimated anywhere from three to $13 billion per year, and that is expected to increase for all the reasons I've already told you. And really that economic burden is totally related to untreated painful osteoarthritis, and I've already shown you the downhill uh, downstream effects. This is showing you uh, Womack pain score. This is a commonly used pain reported, patient reported pain measure where scores from zero to 100, from low to the worst pain, and predicted arthritis attributable costs. What you see is an exponential relationship so that as the pain that people are living with gets worse, the costs go up. Uh, OA pain severity has been linked to healthcare use, absenteeism and presenteeism, and early retirement. There is no cure to osteoarthritis, and so those costs continue to accrue over time. 
uh, they are indefinite. So just to summarize, I think I've shown you that osteoarthritis is most definitely a serious condition, and I'm glad to say the FDA has agreed. It is associated with substantial persistent morbidity impacting day-to-day -day functioning. It is a major barrier to mobility, i.e. walking, and thus maintaining physical activity with many uh, downstream effects on other chronic conditions. There is no cure. Joint replacement is effective, but it does not result in remission. Um, we desperately need new and effective uh, OA interventions, uh, not just drugs, but drugs uh, in particular, and we're hoping that this endeavor will lead to that result. Thank you very much.